Our goal today is to cover some safety guidelines for early season travel for Continental Divide Trail hikers in the South San Juan Mountains. My name is Sandy Kobrock. I live in Pagosa Springs and I run the Wolf Creek Avalanche School and own the Pass Creek Yurt, which is a yurt closer to Wolf Creek Pass than Coombers Pass along the Continental Divide. I've lived in the San Juans for the last 27 years and have a lot of experience in both the North San Juans and the South San Juans with the snowpack and with the mountains. I've skied from Coombrus Pass to Wolf Creek Pass in the spring, all snow covered terrain, and I've hiked from Wolf Creek Pass to Stony Pass in the summer. So I am familiar with the terrain that you are entering into. I was an Outward Bound instructor for 15 years, both in Colorado as well as in the West, in California, Oregon, and Washington, a mountaineering instructor, and spent a lot of time, many, many days, months on the Pacific Crest Trail, as well as here in Colorado on the Continental Divide Trail. The goals of this short presentation are to help you make wise decisions in the snow-covered mountains early season here in the San Juans. Making safe route choices in relationship to icy slopes as well as triggering avalanches can be life-saving. The things we're gonna, that you need to know that we're gonna talk about are how to recognize an avalanche slope, how to choose the right route, having recognized avalanche slopes, how to travel through avalanche terrain, what to do if someone is caught in an avalanche, and the weather conditions that enhance avalanche hazard. Avalanches happen in steep open bowls, on steep open slopes, and in gullies. It doesn't take a big slope to bury and kill you in an avalanche. Here are two photos. The one on the right is of a small avalanche. And the one on the left is an incident where two people were caught in a roof avalanche. They were both caught and buried. There was no one there to dig them out. And unfortunately, they were killed. Traveling in avalanche terrain requires sometimes that you stay out of the avalanche slope and stay on the ridge. You can see in this photo that if you're traveling where there is no snow, there isn't going to be any avalanche hazard. One of the snow formations that in the mountains can be very dangerous is called a cornice. It's a snow overhang that forms along a ridge or along a gully. These can easily break off from your weight on them in the spring in particular. So staying away from the edge, sometimes it's hard to tell if you are on a cornice or not. So staying away from the edge of a ridge is imperative. If you do have to cross a slope or a bowl that's greater than 30 degrees, here's the way to do it. Now I mentioned 30 degrees because avalanches happen on slopes that are 30 degrees and steeper. So the key slope angle for triggering avalanches is 30 to 45 degrees. Notice I say triggering. You can be under a slope that is of those steepnesses, 30 to 45 degrees, but is basically flat and trigger the avalanche above you on the steeper slope. So traveling across, and if you choose to travel across or you need to travel across an avalanche slope that's steep enough to avalanche, you want to go from safe point to safe point, and that could be lower angle or maybe no snow. Those would be safe points. You want to keep your pack attached to you. It's not like crossing a creek where you want to unbuckle your pack. You want it to be firmly attached to you. You're going to need that gear if you get caught in an avalanche and it can help to protect you in the avalanche. If possible, have folks cross the avalanche slope one at a time. This is so that if someone is 
caught in an avalanche, there are people to rescue them. If it's not practical for, for you to cross one at a time, the slope is too big, as in the lower photo, you can spread out. The idea being that not everyone in the group is caught in the avalanche. You want to watch, so keep your eye on the person crossing the avalanche slope so that if they are caught, you know where to begin searching for them. You don't need to search above where they were and you don't need to search to either side of where they were. And I'm gonna talk about that in the next slide. This photo is a great photo of where not to be uh, if you think that there is avalanche hazard. So one of the things you're gonna look for to see if, to know if there is avalanche hazard is if you're sinking in more than six inches or you have six inches of new snow. So if either of those things were true, you want in this case to be traveling on the ridge and not across this big slope. So if you're caught in an avalanche, you want to, if possible, as the avalanche initiates, try to slow yourself down and let as much snow as possible go past you. So if there's a tree nearby or rocks, or you can dig into the surface of the snow that's left after the avalanche has released, all of those things can help to slow you down. Once caught in the avalanche flow, you wanna to fight to stay on top. Protect your head and face from rocks and trees. And basically you're gonna be at the whim of the, of the avalanche flow. It's very, very strong. You can't, um, yeah, once you're caught in the avalanche flow, you're just, it's like being surfed, being caught in the surf in the, in the ocean if you're a surfer. As you start to feel the snow slow down, make a big effort to get to the surface. And then once the snow stops, try to extricate yourself. Most folks caught and buried in avalanches cannot extricate themselves. If you are the rescuer, once the avalanche has come to rest, you want to look around and make sure that you stay safe. You do not want to get caught in another avalanche or slip down the slope, the steep slope. You're not going to be any help to the person who's buried if you become another victim. So once you take a deep breath, look around, see if you can see them. Uh, are they on the snow surface? In which case that's great because avalanche, the prime, one of the primary problems with avalanches is it's like a uh, drowning where the person can't breathe. So time is of the essence. So if they're not visible or no part of them is visible, so travel to where you last saw them or you were paying attention to them traveling across the slope. So go to where you last saw them and begin your search. You're looking for clues on the surface. They're hiking poles, articles of clothing, anything that indicates the direction that their body was taken with the avalanche. This can narrow your search area. And like I said, time is of the essence. This person is not breathing. Snow flows like water down the hill. So they will be downhill of their last seen point and in the flow of the snow. Likely burial locations are any place where the snow is deepest. So the snow will pile up above trees and rocks. It tries to fill in any dips. So below a cliff or a road cut or a bench or depressions in the avalanche path. The other place where it tends to be deepest is at the very end of the avalanche debris, which is called the toe. Oftentimes that's where you will find a body that's been taken down in an avalanche. You're gonna use your hiking poles to methodically, but quickly probe three feet deep into these uh, areas of deepest deposition. Be methodical in your probing, probe about a foot apart you want to be as thorough as you can be and yet be fast so that you don't have to hike back up to research areas above you. Once you've located the body with your probe, you want to dig them out as quickly as possible using anything that you have. So cook pots, snowshoes, if you're carrying a trowel and be ready to do first aid. So the common first aid for avalanche burial or rescue breaths or CPR, you wanna remove the snow from their mouth and begin to help them to breathe. They may begin to breathe spontaneously or they may not. The other injuries that people can suffer from an avalanche 
is uh, trauma. So being um, thrown up against a tree or rocks or just from the violence of being tossed in the avalanche as it travels down the slope. After you have the person extricated, hypothermia can become an issue. So be aware of that they have wet clothes, especially if it's windy or the temperatures are cool. And after doing first aid, you're gonna to need to think about evacuating this person depending on what their injury is. So as you're traveling through the mountains, avalanches are an issue, but also slipping on a steep, icy slope. Like I said, in the San Juans, there are lots of steep slopes. So early morning when the snow is hard or shaded slopes during the day, being cautious and thinking about what's gonna happen to me if I cross this slope and I slip. Am I gonna be chucked off a cliff? Am I gonna go through a bunch of rocks like in this photo? Where am I gonna end up? A gully is particularly dangerous with avalanches. It does not take very much snow if all the snow ends up in a gully to bury you quite deeply. Same with a creek. Ending up in a creek can be a bad deal, as well as looking to see if at the bottom of the snow slope, there are rocks that have melted out. And so as you slide down the slope, you're gonna end up into this rock pile, which can be particularly hazardous. Here's a photo of how a slope can be in the morning if it's frozen overnight and it's slippery. Weather that increases the avalanche danger is six inches or more of new snow in the last 24 hours or 48 hours. It can, a slope can get snow blown onto it. So even if it hasn't snowed, if the wind has blown and blown six inches or more snow onto a slope that's steeper than 30 degrees, that increases the avalanche hazard. The other thing that increases the avalanche hazard is the warming of the snow from the sun or from the air temperature. So the east slopes will soften first due to the snow, come, excuse me, due to the sun warming them during the day, then the south slope and then the west slopes. And again, anytime you're sinking into your ankle on a slope that's steeper than 30 degrees, you can trigger an avalanche on that slope. If the snow didn't freeze hard overnight, then all slopes are suspect regardless of the time of day or air temperature. Resources at your disposal, uh, the Colorado Avalanche Information Center, which I'm gonna tell you about in the next slide, uh, is a, is a uh, resource that you have. On your iPhone, so we've been talking about these slope angles that are steeper than 30 degrees, you wonder how steep is 30 degrees? Well, you can actually measure your slope angles with your iPhone. So look on your phone and see what, it's often um, associated with the compass or on the iPhone, the newest app is called the measure app and you can measure slope angles with those devices. This is what the Colorado Avalanche Information Center looks like uh, online. They do, in the spring, they do 36-hour weather forecast as well as an avalanche hazard forecast through the end of May. This is a tool that you can use with a topographical map and load onto your phone. It's called CalTopo and it shows slope angle steepness by color. So the left-hand topo map is of the Adams Fork area of the Continental Divide Trail that you will be traversing through. And on the right-hand side is that very same map with this Cal Topo slope angle applied to it. So before you head into the field, you can download uh, maps onto your phone and use this Avenza app. It will show you with your GPS, you don't need to have cell service, show you with your GPS where you are in relationship to these steeper slopes. You can see the key here. So the slopes that are orange colored are this critical angles of 30 to 45 degrees where avalanches can initiate. So this is very helpful in your trip planning to say where 
am I in danger? And as well as, as you're traveling through the mountains. So taking the time to maybe pause in your trip if you have new snow or warming temps to wait for either colder temps or to let the new snow settle out a little bit can be really important. So taking the time to look at the big picture, not just, oh, we're in such a hurry, we gotta get there. Like just take a breath and see whether or not heading into the mountains right now is the thing to do or give it a day or two. And the same when you're on, when you're traveling on the, on the uh, Continental Divide Trail is, do I just need to, did we get a bunch of snow? Do I just need to sit here for a day and make sure that the hazard is decreasing, which it will do over time? It doesn't take much to bury you. Uh, once you're knocked over by an avalanche, you aren't very big. And so it doesn't take very much snow to bury you in, particularly if you are alone and there's no one to rescue you. So just taking a deep breath and making sure that you aren't putting yourself at danger by being in a hurry. Thanks for watching this video. Have a safe and awesome adventure. I hope that this has been helpful.